Don't tell any of my other regulars, but this is my favourite segment of the week with the wonderful Kel Richards, who joins me now from Sydney. Uh, Kel, we've got a lot of words today that have come in on my Instagram, uh, Peter Credlin AO, that's my official Instagram. People have left words. I know they contact you on your ozwords.com.au as well. The first one, we use it a lot. Mike in Victor Harbour wants to know, where do we get that word woke from? What does it mean? Well, it means really aware and of what's going on, you know, and, and a bit sharper than everyone else. Actually, started as black American slang, first recorded 1891. And the place it first turns up is in a story by Joel Chandler Harris. That's the bloke who invented Uncle Remus and Br'er Rabbit and those characters. And in one of his stories, one of the characters says to another, uh, he just ain't woke enough yet. And it remained entirely within the black community through right into the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Then... Um, very politically correct uh, white people did a bit of cultural appropriation and stole it to say they're more awake, they're more aware than all the rest of us and we're just not very awake to what's going on. They are woke. I am surprised then we're even allowed to use it. I'm surprised we haven't been cancelled, but there you go. <laughs> hey, uh, NRL... My team, my wonderful team of producers are all based in Sydney. I'm down here in Melbourne. We're having a conversation on the morning call today about the state of origin. And this is also raised by a viewer from Auckland, Ray. Maroon or Maroon? I grew up saying Maroon. Yes, but I know yes. if you're in New South Wales and Queensland, it's Maroon. Why the difference? The story is that the word came into English from French, 1594, a very long time ago, and it was originally the name of a large chestnut. Now, my theory is that either the chestnut or the tree it grew in was a brownish, crimson or claret colour. So the name, the French name, was Marron, and that name transferred from the plant to the colour. So it was this French word Marron. And the very earliest spelling of it is M A R. O N E. So that's the classical, uh, traditional, historical pronunciation, the one that you're using, Peter. And in fact, that went on uh -huh. being the only pronunciation for 350 years. So you're you're right on the money. But I think a whole lot of people these days never heard the classic pronunciation, and so they just looked at the word and they saw how it was spelt and they thought, oh well, I'll say it like that. And that's what they're doing. So uh, I, I, put, I know the dictionaries these days say either pronunciation is acceptable. I accept Maroon. I don't necessarily accept any other. And the Blues, by the way, will phone it in tonight. <laughs> hey, yeah, this is another interesting one. Kathy in Canberra, she sent us a, an obituary from 2017. And this is apropos of our conversation about past as opposed to death and dying, you know, dropping out of our speech. This is the obituary and I'll read it out. It said, she hasn't passed on. She hasn't passed over. She hasn't gone ahead. She isn't in a better place. She's died. <laughs> I might keep that for me one time. I mean, I do like <laughs> direct speech and I reckon, I reckon we're making a bit of an impact here, Cal. We are. And Cathy made the point that the words were written, that paragraph was written, that wonderful paragraph, was written by the lady who died. And she had passed it on to the funeral directors because she'd pre-booked her funeral and said, this must be in my obituary. And I think that's just lovely. That's wonderful. But I, I think one of the other things it shows us is we are part of a small army of people who prefer plain speaking and blunt language and saying what things really are and not beating around the bush. Spot on. Uh, Dave also from Canberra wants to know why the person in the chair chairing the parliamentary debate and doesn't speak very much is paradoxically called the speaker. Because his job originally was not to speak to the parliament, but to speak on behalf of the parliament. Since 1377, the speaker is the person appointed by the parliament as their mouthpiece, their speaker, in those early days to speak to the king. And of course, British kings being what they were, uh, it was a dangerous job. You could lose your head. But he spoke for the parliament, not to the parliament. Hence, he was the mouthpiece, uh -huh. the spokesman, the speaker. What's also interesting too is they weren't allowed to bring notes in for many, many years and you rarely see notes in the British Parliament. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that next week actually. That's a good distinction. Got to leave it there, Kel Richards. See you next Wednesday.